Good morning, friends. A blog. Otto became a very special friend who used to come on the street on the train to see her on afternoons. She had off from the occasional work she found. She combined the work with classes she attended in the school in Teplice, where she and Margit were making up for some of the time they had lost in schooling, if that were possible. Teplice is an old spa city renowned for its waters. Dita had finally found her Burgoff. There were no Alps as in the Magic Mountain, but the high country of Bohemia was close by. She liked to stroll along the streets with their geometric stone pavements, despite the fact that the war had severely punished this beautiful city with its stately buildings. She occasionally wondered what had become of the enigmatic Madame Chachot, who left the spa resort in search of new horizons. She would like to have asked her advice about what to do with her life. The beautiful synagogue had burned down, and its scorched ruins were over were a reminder of those burned-out years. On Saturdays, Ota accompanied her on her walks. He talked to her about a thousand things. He was a young man with a voracious curiosity. Everything interested him. He sometimes complained a little of having to take various combinations of trains and buses to travel the 80 kilometers between Prague and Teplis, but his complaints were more of like a satisfied purr of a cat. There were months of pleasant strolls through those squares, which little by little regained their flower pots and began to give Teplis back its charming air of a town of hot springs. During those walks, Ota and Dita gradually became entwined. A year after their meeting in the line at the document's office, Ota said something to Dita that changed everything. Why don't you come back to Prague? I can't love you from a distance. They had already told each other their entire lives. It was the moment to start from scratch, to begin again. Ota and Dita were married in Prague, after a great amount of paperwork, Ota managed to take back his father's business and to get it going again. It was an exciting project because, in a way, Ota was able to recover the past. He couldn't bring back those who were absent to erase the scar or erase the scars, but at least it was a way of returning to the Prague of 1939. Even though Ota wasn't sure he wanted to be a businessman, he, like his father, preferred opera scores to balance sheets and the language of poets to the language of lawyers. But he didn't have the time to be disillusioned. The footprints of the Nazi boots on the streets of Prague had not yet disappeared when the boots of the Soviets made their mark. With that delight delightful obstinacy history has of repeating itself, the factory was again confiscated. This time, it wasn't in the name of the Third Reich, but of the Communist Party. Ota didn't give in, neither did Dita. They were born to swim against the tide. Thanks to his mastery of English and knowledge of literature, Ota found work in the Ministry of Culture, choosing which new English language publications were interesting enough to be translated into Czech. He was the only employee at his level who was not a Communist Party member. Many in that period spouted Leninist slogans, but no one was going to teach him anything. He knew more about Marxism than any of them. He had read more than any of them. He knew better than anyone that communi communism was a beautiful path that ended at a precipice. They accused him of being an en enemy of the party, and things started to get difficult. In 1949, the year the first child was born, Ota and Dita decided to immigrate to Israel, where they ran into another old inmate from Block 31, Avi Fisher, now called Avi Ofer, the man who had converted a modest barrack full of child prisoners into a cheerful glee club. He helped them find work at the Hadassim School near Nat Natanya, there, Ota and Dita worked as English teachers at one of the most renowned schools in Israel. The school accepted many children who came in the wave of immigrants after the, world, after the end of World War II. Later, the school took care of children from families with problems and students at risk of social exclusion. They always employed teachers who were particularly involved in those sorts of issues, but it was hard to find people more sensitive to the suffering of others than Ota and Dita. The couple had three children and four grandchildren. Ota, the great storyteller from Block 31, wrote various books. One of them, The Painted Wall, fictionalized the lives of a series of people in a family camp B2B. Dita and Ota experienced life's up and downs together for 55 years. They never stopped loving and supporting each other. They shared books, an indestructible sense of humor, life in general. They grew old together. Only death could break the iron bond forged in the most terrible times anyone could experience. Postscript. There are still some important things to tell about the librarian of Block 31. 
and about Freddie Hirsch. The bricks used to construct this story are facts, and they're held together in these pages with a mortar of fiction. The real name of the librarian of Block 31, whose life was inspired, the, has inspired these pages, is Dita Palachovka. Palachova. Sorry. Ota Keller, the young teacher in the novel, is based on the person who would become Dita's husband, the teacher, Ota Kraus. A brief mention of the existence of a minuscule library in a concentration camp made by Al Alberto Manguel in his book The Library at Night was the point of departure for my journalistic investigation, which gave rise to this book. There are those who don't share my fascination for discovering why certain people risk their lives to run a secret school and clandestine library in Auschwitz-Birkenau. There are those who might think that this was an act of useless bravery in an extermination camp when there were other, more pressing concerns. Books don't cure illnesses. They can't be used as weapons to defeat an army of executioners. They don't fill your stomach or quench your thirst. It's true. Culture isn't necessary for the survival of mankind. For that, you only need bread and water. It's also true that with bread to eat and water to drink, humans survive, but with only this, humanity dies. If human beings aren't deeply moved by beauty, if they don't close their eyes and activate their imaginations, if they aren't capable of asking themselves questions and discerning the limits of their ignorance, then they are men, then they are men or women, but they are not complete persons. Nothing significant distinguishes them from a salmon or a zebra or a musk ox. There's a great deal of information about Auschwitz on the internet, but it only talks about the place. If you want a place to speak to you, you have to go there and stay long enough to hear what it has to tell you. In order to find some trace of the family camp or some track to follow, I traveled, Auschwitz. I traveled to Auschwitz. I needed not only quantitative data and dates, but to feel the vibration of that accursed place. I flew to Krakow, and from there I took a train to Auschwitz, Auschwitz. Nothing in that small, peaceful city hints at the horror experienced on its outskirts. Everything is so normal that you can even get to the camp entrance by bus. Auschwitz I has a parking lot for buses and a museum-like entrance. It used to be a Polish army barracks, and the pleasant rectangular brick buildings separated by wide paved avenues complete with pecking birds give no indication at first sight of the horror. But there are various pavilions you can go into. One of them has been designed like an aquarium. You walk along a dark corridor, lined with huge, illuminated fish tanks. They contain worn-out shoes, mountains, thousands of them. Two tons of human hair from it form a dark sea. Dirty pro prosthesis re resemble broken toys. And there are thousands of pairs of broken glasses, almost all of them with round frames like the one Morgenstern wore. The family camp B2B is three kilometers away at Auschwitz-Birkenau. The phantasmagorical watchtower at the entrance of the lager still stands, with a tunnel at its base that was used from 1944 onward to allow the railway line to run right into the camp. The original huts were burned after the war. There are a few reconstructed ones you can ones you can go in. There are a few reconstructed ones you can go inside. They are horse stables which seem gloomy even when they are clean and well ventilated. Behind this first line of huts which are in what would have been the quarantine camp B2A, there is an immense expanse of waste ground of waste ground that originally contained the rest of the camps. To see the spot that B2B occupied in its day, you have to abandon the route of the guided tour, which doesn't go beyond the first row of replica huts and skirt the entire perimeter. You have to be on your own. Walking through Auschwitz-Birkenau in solitude means enduring a very cold wind that carries echoes of the voices of those who remain there forever, and became part of the mud present-day visitors walk on. All that's left of B2B is the metal door at the entrance to the camp and an intently solitary space where even bushes barely grow. Only cobblestones, wind, and silence remain. A tranquil or ghostly place. It depends how much the eyes, the eyes looking at it know. I returned from that trip with many questions and almost no answers. Some sense of what the Holocaust was that no history book could teach me, and completely by chance a copy of an important book. Je me suis évidé d'Auschwitz, the French translation of Rudolf Rosenberg's memoir, I Cannot Forgive, which I found in the bookstore at the Shua Holocaust Museum in Krakow. There was another book that particularly interested me and in which I started to track down as soon as I got home. It was a novel set in the family camp with the title The Painted Wall, written by someone called Otta Kraus. 
There was a website where the book could be purchased and sent to you cash on delivery. It wasn't a very professional website. You couldn't pay with a credit card, but there was a contact address. I wrote to the address express expressing my interest in the book and asking how payment should be made. And then I received one of those emails that proved to be a crossroads in your life. The reply, very polite, was that I could send the money via Western Union. There was an address in Netanya, Israel, and the message was signed, D. Kraus. With all the tact I could muster, muster, I asked if she was Dita Kraus, the girl who had been in the family camp in Auschwitz-Birkenau. She was. The librarian of Block 31 was alive and was writing an email to me. Life is full of surprises, but sometimes it can be truly extraordinary. Dita was not so young anymore. At that stage, she was 80, but she was still the same passionate and tenacious person she had always been, who was now battling to ensure that her husband's books were not forgotten. From that moment, we began to correspond. Her incredible kindness helped us to understand each other despite my poor English. Eventually, we agreed to meet in Prague, where she spent a few weeks every year, and she took me to visit the Terezin ghetto. Dita is not one of those old-style, placid grandmothers. She's a friendly whirlwind who immediately found accommodation for me close to her apartment and organized everything. When I arrived at the Hotel Triska's reception desk, she was already waiting for me on one of the sofas in the lobby. She was exactly as I had imagined her, thin, restless, active, at once serious and cheerful, totally charming. Dita's life wasn't easy during the war years, nor has it, has it been easy since. She and Oto were very close until his death in 2000. They had two sons and a daughter. Their daughter died before she turned 20 after a long illness. But Dita hasn't allowed herself to be broken by fate's blows. She didn't allow it back then. She won't allow it ever. It is remarkable how someone who carries so much accumulated pain manages to keep on smiling. It's all I have left, Dita tells me. But she has many other things left. Her energy, her dignity as a battler against everything and everyone. And this makes her an upright 80-year-old woman with fire in her eyes. As we travel around Terezin, she refuses to take a taxi, and I don't dare contradict her thriftiness, typical of anyone who has lived through bad times. We take the subway, and she stands. There are free seats, but she doesn't sit down. No one can vanquish a woman like that. The entire Third Reich failed to do it. Indefatigable or tired, but never... Indefa indefatigable or tired, but never resigned to giving up. Dita asked me to give her a hand because she's going to take 50 copies of the painted wall to the Terezin Memorial Store, which has run out. We don't rent a car. She insists that we go by coach. We make the same trip she made almost 60 years earlier, although now she's dragging along a suitcase full of books. I'm scared she might find herself affected by this trip back in time, but she's a strong woman. Right now, her greatest concern is to restock the ghetto library with these books. Terezin turns out to be a peaceful place full of square buildings, dotted with lawns and trees and bathed in brilliant May light. Dita not only drops off the books, but being her normal feisty self gets me a free entry into the permanent exhi exhibition. The day is full of emotionally charged moments. Among the pictures of the ghetto and in internees on the wall is one by Dita herself, a dark and gloomy picture that shows a much, much less dazzling town than the ones we're walking around now. There's also a room with the names of the children who were sent to Terezin. Dita runs through the list and smiles as she remembers some of them. They are almost all now dead. Four video screens show the testimony of survivors talking about their experiences in Terezin. An older man with a deep voice appears in one of them. It's Ota Kraus, Dita's husband. He speaks in Czech. And although there are English subtitles, I don't pay attention to them because I am too hypnotized by his voice. It conveys such composure but you can't help but listen to it. Dita silently pays attention. She looks grave, but doesn't shed a single tear. We leave, and she tells me we're going to see where she lived. She's made of steel or gives that appearance. I ask her if it isn't difficult for her. It is, she replies, but she doesn't stop, continuing on her way at a good pace. I had never before met a woman with such extraordinary courage in every aspect of her life. Where she was housed during her time in the Terezin ghetto is now an inoffensive neighborhood block of apartments. Dita looks up at the third floor. She tells me that one of her cousins, who was a carpenter, made her a bookshelf. She tells me much more as we head toward another building where one floor has been preserved as a museum, its rooms full of bunks. Just as it was during the ghetto years, it's an oppressive place, too small for so many beds. They've even kept the earthenware basin the occupants used as a communal toilet. 
Can you imagine the smell? Dita asks me. No, I can't. We go into another room where there's a security guard. Pictures and posters from the ghetto era hang on the walls. An opera by the famous pianist and composer Victor Ullman is playing. He became one of the most active contributors to culture in Terezin. Dita stops in the middle of the room, empty but for the board attendant. She quietly starts to sing Ullman's opera. Her voice is the voice of the children of Terezin, which rings out again that morning for a much reduced but no less surprised audience. There is another moment when time goes backward and Dita becomes Ditinka and her woolen socks and with her woolen socks and eyes of a dreamer singing the children's opera Brundabar. During our return trip to Prague, Dita energetically asked the coach driver to open the sliding roof so we won't die of asphy asphyxiation from heat and a vehicle with windows that don't open. The driver ignores her, so she starts to pull the hatch lever herself and I join her. Between the two of us, we succeed. It is while, it is while we are sitting in the coach that a topic has been buzzing around in my head for months comes up in the conversation. What happened that afternoon of the 8th of March 1944 when Freddie Hirsch went off to think about the proposal from the resistance that he led a camp that he lead a camp uprising given the eminent extermination of the September transport in the gas ovens? Why did a man as composed as Freddie Hirsch commit suicide with an overdose of luminol? Dita looks at me. There's a whole world in her eyes, and I begin to understand. I read in her eyes what I had read in the lines written by Ota in his book, but which I had taken as artistic license or a personal hy hypothesis. After that, wasn't the painted wall a novel, or was it only a novel in order to camouflage certain things which, if Ota had said them in a different context, might have caused him serious problems? Dita asks me to be discreet because she thinks that what she's told me might cause her problems. That's why, rather than, than explaining what she told me, I'll simply reproduce what Ota Krauss wrote and published in, the, in his novel, The Painted Wall, set in the family camp. One of the few characters in the book to appear with his real name is Freddie Hirsch, the instructor in charge of Block 31. This is what the novel recounts about that crucial moment when, after the SS have transferred the September transport to the quarantine camp, the resistance asks Freddie to lead an uprising, and he asks for some time to think about it. After an hour, Hirsch got up from his bed to go and look for one of the medics. I've decided, he said. As soon as it gets dark, I'll give the order. I need a pill to calm my nerves. A revolt against the Germans was madness, the doctor thought. It was death for everyone. The condemned transport, the prisoners in the family camp, and even the team from the hospital requisitioned by Mengele. The man had gone mad. He was clearly out of his mind, and if he wasn't stopped, the Jewish doctors would die with the rest of the prisoners. I'll give you something, a sedative, the doctor told him, and turned to the pharmacist. They were always short of medicine, but they had a small stock of tranquilizers. The pharmacist handed him a bottle of sleeping pills. The doctor emptied the com contents into his hand and immediately clenched his fist around them. He had some cold tea in his mug into which he, he tipped the pills, and then he swirled the tea around until they dissolved in the murky liquid. There are words in the penal codes that describe what really happened to Freddie Hirsch that afternoon in 1944. Sometimes, narrative fiction reveals truths that can't be told any other way. Increasingly, other testimonies contradict the suicide theory that can be found in the official profiles of Hirsch. Michael Honey, a family camp survival, survivor who worked as an errand boy for the medical team, cast doubt on Rosenberg's testimony in his memoir when he speaks of what happened on March 8, 1944. He was given an overdose of luminol when he asked for a pill because of a headache. I hope this book also serves as a vindication of, vindication of the figure of Freddie Hirsch, somewhat tarnished by, tarnished by the false idea that he voluntarily took his own life. As a result of this notion, his integrity in decisive moments has been questioned. Freddie Hirsch did not commit suicide. He would never have abandoned his children. He was a captain. He would have gone down with his ship. This is how he should be remembered as a fighter of extraordinary valor. And naturally, this book is a homage to Dita, from whom I have learned so much. The librarian of Block 31 continues to live in Natyana and travels to spend a few weeks each year in her tiny apartment in Prague, and she'll keep doing it as long as her health allows. She is still a woman of unimaginable curiosity, astuteness, kindness, and integrity. Until now, I hadn't believed in heroes, but I know now they exist. Dita is one of them.